There are many conspiracy theories around COVID-19. Others claim it has originated from snakes in Wuhan to 5G theories and many more theories in between. None of these conspiracy theories have been proved to be an absolute truth. But one thing I know is, the pandemic is not a surprise to God. I submit to you that for some reason beyond our comprehension, God allowed it. But we find hope in Romans 8 verse 28 which reads, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. The pandemic is not the first, neither will it be the last. There has been so many since the world began that mankind survived. Let me cite only the latest examples. In 1855, there was a third plague pandemic. This was also referred to as the modern plague. It caused almost 10 million deaths. In 1918, there was a great flu epidemic, also known as the Spanish flu, the most devastating epidemic in history, with death toll between 20 and 40 million. In 1945, there was a typhus fever. This caused 3 million deaths in Russia alone. In 1957, there was an Asian flu pandemic. The worldwide estimate death rate was between 1 and 2 million. What about 1960 until today? HIV AIDS has grown to a pandemic proportion resulting in an estimated 65 million infections with 25 million deaths. In the midst of all this, what shall we do? What shall we say? Well, one, recognize that God is still on the throne. Two, there is more to life than chasing money. Genesis 47 verse 15 reads, And when money has failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread. Well, money can fail you too. Three, recognize that this too shall pass and we shall bounce back much stronger. We shall recover all that we have lost. Jewel 2 verse 25 reads, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. You see, swarming, crawling, consuming, and chewing encompasses everything lost. Number four, we have already recorded a number of recoveries all over the world. There is a beacon of hope. Lastly, we should seek God's wisdom and favor in this difficult time. It is very difficult to see churches and businesses close doors for a month, but it's more difficult to close the casket of loved ones for good. The cure is here already, and it is called stay at home and save lives. Have a blessed day, and God bless you. Join Marketplace with Charles on an 11-day tour of the Holy Land. Take the route Israel traveled to the Promised Land. Cross over the Red Sea and float on the Dead Seas, the lowest point on earth with amazing healing properties. Experience the vibe of Jericho and cruise on the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus. Visit the pools of Bethesda, Nazareth, Bethlehem, and many more. Walk where Jesus walked and see the Bible come alive. If beautiful memories and an enriched spirit is what you are looking for, then join us in taking Jesus to the marketplace. For more information, call us on plus 27-72-123-0078 or email israel at artofskincare.co.za. To the living legend, Dr. Bill Winston, hey, praise God. and my dad, Apostle Haruna Goro. Welcome to Marketplace with Charles. Mm -hmm. Good to be here. You. you know, let's just give it a shot and go straight away to the questions. I need to know, wealth transfer. What is it, wealth transfer, according to the Bible? Because we work very hard, we sweat for this wealth. And you're always talking about the wealth transfer. What is it? You said it right there, it's a transfer. <laughs> now, what happens is that God has plans for the church 
to be wealthy. Okay. Uh, not just for a person's individual wealth, uh -huh. but for a righteous cause. Meaning that this wealth is going to enable us to take the gospel to the nations on a level that has never been taken. And that the transfer of wealth happens various means. One, by the sowing of a seed. Mm -hmm. Second, by wisdom. Thirdly, in, in, by innovation, methods like that. But God's going to transfer this wealth. In Exodus, you see where in Exodus 14, the wealth got transferred from the Egyptians to the Israelites. And God has wealth transfer all through the Bible. But this wealth transfer, we're coming up on that season where it's going to happen now. That's why you're hearing so much about technology, about innovation and so forth. The church is going to produce products on a whole another level. Mm -hmm. And through these products, you're going to see some of the transfer coming in. Okay. But then what is the role of prayer and fasting? Okay, prayer and fasting. Fasting helps me to center down so that I could hear God clearly. Prayer is the way you get God involved in what you're doing. And God wants to do things for the earth. He's planned to do things for the earth, but prayer gives him to permission and our participation in him doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to believe that God has great stuff for the church, but we tend to limit God one way or another. It is a way in which we can remove or take the limit off. Okay, maybe I'll just come in here. Just as uh, Dr. Bill uh, is talking about, uh, talking about wealth transfer and the role or the place of the church uh -huh. in it. When you look at from what he was sharing in the seminar today, uh, something happened in the garden. The man was given a, a place of dominion and he lost it. Christ came to restore it back. And so through that restoration that Christ came to make happen, we saw you know, little samples of that happening with the children of Israel and saints that served in the Bible. But when Christ died and resurrected, he actually hung on the cross and said, it is finished. And that's uh, everything that has to do with our spirit, soul, and body is paid for in full. We can now get it back. So if I lost something to him or to you, because I did something wrong, I made some wrong moves, took some wrong steps, like the prodigal son, he left home, squandered everything, but because he's got the position of sonship, when he came back home, he didn't need to rework the system. He just took over what belonged to him at home. So the transfer of wealth in the end time, as the Bible says in Zechariah 1.17, that through prosperity, will my cities be spread abroad. Mm -hmm. And when you read Isaiah chapter number 2 from verse 2, we are told that uh, the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted above all on the mountains and the nation will, nations will come streaming back to it. And just before uh, the, 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 I hand over back to you, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 26, God says he gave the sinners, see the unbelievers, the, this world system, the job of gathering so that they can gather and God will take it and give to us. But we need to position ourselves. We can't just sit and wait. We've got to step out. God didn't put Adam in a prayer meeting. He put him in a garden where his presence was. That's a good one. Are you saying, Apostle, um, that the wealth transfer, we're not talking of the wealth transfer like in South Africa from the rich to the poor? or from the whites to the blacks, or to the historical advantage to the historical disadvantage. We are talking about the wealth transfer from the sinners to the children of God. Would I be correct if I say that? But like he says, the children of God has to be prepared. You know, if, uh, if you get some of the richest people in the world, say Bill Gates, and somehow they, uh, something happens and their wealth is taken away from them, um, if you let them exist in this earth uh, and nothing changes, uh, you'll find that wealth back into their hands uh, very shortly yeah. because the people who got the wealth didn't quite have the image of the wealth. And as a result of that, some of this uh, that is naturally 
uh, part of uh, the mindset of the people with the wealth, it ends up back in their hands again. So what has to happen is the preparation that you're talking about mm -hmm. has to be there. People talk about the wealth transfer and so forth, but, but the Bible said the prosperity of a fool will ruin him. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> you've got to prepare people to receive what that wealth is and to be able to do the right thing with that wealth. Mm -hmm. See, if God wants to just hoard it and stack it up in bank somewhere, he could leave it with the center. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> why, why transfer it? Mm -hmm. No, he wants to work it hmm. and, and have it so that all poverty in this nation will, and, and, and suffering from poverty will be eradicated. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody will have a job. There will be, um, you know, all the things that you can dream that can happen, that can empty out prisons and make people productive and all of that. That's what needs to happen. And this money is going to help us do that. Let's go back to the previous question then. How do we take the limits off? Get the trees out. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what happens is, is, is Jesus said over in Matthew 15 that every tree in you that the Heavenly Father has not planted is going to be rooted out. Yeah. Now, what do those trees do? They block the way to the blessing. Mm -hmm. Those trees inside are belief systems that we have taken on as a result of this world system. Mm -hmm. Now, he gets them out of Egypt, but they come out and build a calf in the mm -hmm. wilderness. And they built that calf because the image of that calf is still in them. Mm -hmm. That's called a tree. Now, we got to get the trees out. Jesus cursed this fig tree or another tree. He said a sycamine tree is not fit to eat. So we're going to get all the trees out, the trees of anger, the trees of, of poverty, the trees of, of lack of ownership, so forth. And get all those trees out. And as we teach and apostle teaches and get these trees out, watch this wealth come in and fill that place. Because this, this new tree that we're going to build inside is going to be a tree of abundance. It's going to be a tree that's going to, the Bible says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth hmm. without painful toil mm. for it. And that's what we're going to see in these mm. last days. What is toil, sir? Toil is just anything that uh, destroys the body or mind mm -hmm. uh, in a person's activity that they're encountering or, or that they have been uh, proposing to do. Um, you're going to go to work and next thing you end up toiling. What is that doing? It's destroying this temple. And God doesn't want you to destroy this temple. So we take work to another level, a work without toil, without the, the fatigue of the mind uh, mm. and the physical breakdown of the body. Hmm. And just like uh, as uh, Dr. Bill was speaking, I, I just thought about the scripture that where Jesus was speaking, or he met uh, Peter in Luke chapter 5. They had toiled all night. All and night. you must understand, Peter was a guru. He was a gem at what he does. Mm -hmm. But then laboring the whole night and he caught nothing. Jesus met him at a time that he was already winding up and he's gone home. But then Jesus then turns around his situation because he was trusting human wisdom and his natural wisdom. sweat mm -hmm. and the experience. But sometimes what you know, what you've been used to, the way it's always been may not work in this season. And so that's why one has to position himself. I mean, when we talk about wealth transfer, it's got a lot to do with positioning. As Dr. Bill said, the first position has got to be in our mind. Mm -hmm. Because if the mind, the Bible speaks about the renewing of the mind. That's the only way we're going to get back what, is, what God has already planned that's out for us. Christ in us is the hope glory. of glory. And glory speaks of wealth. Yes. And the wealth transfer we're talking about, Prophet uh, Haggai says in Haggai chapter 6, when you read uh, uh, chapter, chapter uh, uh, 2 <laughs> from verse 6, it says uh, that there's going to be a shaking in this end time. Uh -huh. And then it says the glory of the latter house will outweigh the former glory. Uh -huh. And it says, then I will fill this temple with glory. Uh -huh. And Paul speaks about us being the temple is not just a building. So God wants to bring back his beauty, his essence into us. And then through us, 
because a poor man's voice nobody wants to hear. Yep. There is no influence without affluence. That's why God is going to give back power. He says, go ye into the world and preach. We can't go broke. And that's why he's empowering us. And it's those that know the reason why God is blessing. Wow. Favor. Favor. It's not fair. Favor is, you, nobody, nobody did anything significant without favor. Nobody. And favor is God acting on your behalf uh, many times, even though you don't deserve it. And he is putting you in position or giving you advantages that nobody else has only because of the blessing of favor. And that favor comes on my life. I had favor to do certain things in Chicago, at certain places I go, um, I get favor and so forth. But favor will take you uh, from the back to the front. Mm. It'll take you from the bottom to the top. And this favor is something that all of us uh, should pray for. I confess favor over my life almost every day, that the favor of God surrounds me like a shield. It produces supernatural increase, restoration, honor, increased assets, greater victories, recognition, prominence, preferential treatment, petitions granted, policies and rules changed, and battles won, which I do not have to fight. So you do that every morning. You expect favor yeah. wherever you go. Sure. Apostle Haruna, yeah, yeah. Look, look at this. We've got so many people who are against the gospel of prosperity um, in this country. And uh, we are shutting it down. You know, we, they, they say, no, um, you either fall down, you, you backslide because of prosper uh, preaching against prosperity. But uh, to my surprise, most of the people who preach against prosperity, they also collect money from the same poor people, but they don't call it money, they call it tithes and offerings, because they also need it. Why do we shut it down? And why is it that we don't want to speak about prosperity? Because I want to believe that when Jesus Christ died, he did not only die for my salvation, well, that is a priority, but he also died for my success. Why are we preaching it down? I think it's based on ignorance. And then some people, uh, you see, as he said during the seminar, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Uh -huh. So when people don't know the purpose of a thing, they start to abuse it. So the issue why some people preach against it is because they just don't know. But I mean, we can't be smarter than God. We can, it, it, the, God says it. Prosperity is not just a, about money only. Yeah. And salvation is not just about prosperity that has to do with cash. Mm -hmm. Salvation is the total freedom of a person's spirit, soul, and body, which Christ already paid for. And that's going to affect your soul, affect your body, affect your mind, affect everything about you. So, so the true salvation is not this, what people call tag, the American gospel or prosperity gospel. It's the full gospel that has soul, and body and every part of us. So it's it, anybody that attacks that is because they do not know. You know, and if Jesus was blessed, the apostles were blessed. All the patriots in the Bible, from God planted a garden with gold inside. So if God doesn't want us to have material prosperity, wouldn't have done it. Wouldn't have done it for Job. Isaac would not have been so blessed. He began to prosper, continued to prosper, and became very prosperous. So everyone that serves God, they are supposed to prosper, spirit, soul, and body. And you cannot attract what you curse. Yeah, or what you, what you, you resist. Awesome. Dr. Bell, Daniel 1, verses 20. You always refer to that when you speak of disruptive innovations. Do you want to take my viewers through that? Innovation is really the topic of today because um, for us to solve the problems that need to be solved, we're going to have to have new solutions. And um, <clears throat> you're getting power outages in countries and all kinds of things. It takes wisdom again. It takes innovation. People are going to have to come up with ideas or come up with products and services that can cut these things off. Um, God loves people. The Bible says God so loved the world. This is not just a church. He loves the world. He loves them and he doesn't want them to suffer. 
And so God gives ideas and innovation so that we can lift the burden from suffering humanity. Innovation is supposed to be really headquartered in the church. The Bible talks about it over in the uh, book of Ephesians. It talks about in the last days the manifold wisdom of God coming through the church. The church should be the epicenter of new ideas and inventions. And I think we're moving into a time that it is going to be. I think God's people first had to get off of trusting a system that's failing. Mm -hmm. And they, for some reason, were tied in with a system that the Bible says, cursed is a man that trusteth in a man. And blessed is a man that trusteth in God. I think as people switch systems, they're going to see a new uh, level of revelation coming for ideas, concepts, insights, so forth and so on. So creativity is about to flourish in the house of God. And people are going to see, uh, have answers to things that uh, the world is going to be attracted to. Apostle, mm. your parting words to the viewers. Well, uh, I'll just say, um, let's stick with what Christ has done. Paul was the one that said that we've been redeemed from the curse, curse of the law. And, and he already became a curse for us, so that the blessings of Abraham will come to us as that there are Gentiles or the unsaved. So now the blessing is here. And when you have him, you've got the blesser living inside of you. And he can't be in me, and I'm struggling with sin. I'm struggling with, with being broke or struggling with sickness. So it's not his will. But if it does come, I should see it as an attack and an arrow of the enemy to rob me of my redemption. And so I need to take a stand, speak the word, and stand in faith, and resist the devil steadfast in faith, and he will flee. And people have to be taught how to do this. This is, this is come naturally. That's why you've got the pastors in the churches or the apostles and so forth. But people have to be taught how to live under this new covenant. They have to be taught uh, how uh, to get uh, to live from the inside out instead of the outside in, letting that um, affect them. One prophet, uh, prophet has said, you know, if you see something wrong in your country, fix it. And he's talking about not just naturally, but supernaturally, that we can do that. By the way, the other thing is that a lot of times what people don't believe, they don't believe in the power of the Word of God. That that this word of God can turn around any situation in the earth, yeah. that, that it has this kind of um, power, if you will. And, and so they don't invest in it. Uh, they're more investing in uh, social and in social this and media that and so forth and so on. But Jesus didn't have any of that. John the Baptist didn't even have any of that. Um, one day the disciples asked Jesus when they went out and nobody came out, they asked Jesus, why don't you call fire down and burn this village up? <laughs> yeah. See, Jesus hadn't prayed for that place. He, he, he played for, prayed for Jerusalem. But my point to you is, is we get so technologically driven and so forth. Faith is the original technology. Mm. And so we need to invest more in that technology to do things and have faith to get things done for us rather than us trying to here invest in all these things. There was one time where you didn't have but one physician. He was a general practitioner. And he could come out and look in your mouth and tell you about your tonsils or look at your feet and tell you about that. But now you've got a specialist in everything. Well, see, that's good. We're going back to the garden now. You're not going to need but one thing, and that's faith. <laughs> that's the wisdom of God. He's going to tell you everything. So that's kind of where we're going right now. I think we got to un uncomplicate the Bible again mm. and come down to its fundamental truth, which is based on faith. Amen. Well, Dr. Bill, you heard it. He said, this thing is taught. You know, when I grew up and I started working, I was extremely poor. I remember the day when I went to teach for the first time and I had to borrow clothes from friends because I did not even have a suit. I did not even have shoes. I had absolutely nothing. But I followed the teaching of Apostle Haruna Goro. I followed the great legend, Dr. Bill, from an early age. And his teaching 
changed me. They made me who I am. And if you want a success in your life, follow these two great men. Follow them, watch their YouTubes, go to Joseph's Business School, register there, and I guarantee you, your life will never be the same again. God bless you. Join Marketplace with Charles on an 11-day tour of the Holy Land. Take the route Israel traveled to the Promised Land. Cross over the Red Sea and float on the Dead Seas, the lowest point on earth with amazing healing properties. Experience the vibe of Jericho and cruise on the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus. Visit the pools of Bethesda, Nazareth, Bethlehem and many more. Walk where Jesus walked and see the Bible come alive. If beautiful memories and an enriched spirit is what you are looking for, then join us in taking Jesus to the marketplace. For more information, call us on plus two seven seven two one two three zero zero seven eight or email Israel at artofskincare.co.za.